Hello and welcome. I'm Rosemary Pena, President of the Black German Heritage and Research Association and Adjunct Professor of German Studies at the University of British Columbia at Vancouver. Our conversation today is the 23rd in the BGHRIA's All Black Lives Matter series. My colleague Emily Frazier-Rath and I are delighted to host John Cantara as our special guest, and we are grateful to Sonia Donaldson for consenting to be our discussant. But before we commence, I'll ask Emily if she would like to say a few introductory words and then turn the program over to John and Sonia. Emily? Thank you, Rosemary. And thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Emily Frazier Rath and I'm a visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College and also the executive director of the BGHRA. We are so excited to be able to host John Kantara and our moderator, uh, Dr. Sonia Donaldson today um, and invite them warmly to Davidson College and to the BGHRA. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, the Dean Rusk International Studies Program Speakers Fund for helping to make today's event possible. In particular, I'd like to thank Verna Case, Dr. Verna Case, the Interim Director of the Dean Rusk Program and Meg Zweifel for her support and um, for their continued support. I want to thank the Department of German Studies Administrator, Meg Sawicki, as well as Jennifer Joyce and Susan Caldwell, who work behind the scenes here at Davidson, doing all of the logistical work and whose patience with me I greatly appreciate and um, who, whose um, support is never ending. It is my honor to introduce to you our moderator today, Dr. Sonia Donaldson. Mm -hmm. She is Associate Professor of English at New Jersey City University, and she currently is completing her book manuscript, Irreconcilable Dif Differences, Memory, History, and the Echoes of Diaspora. She has also launched a digital humanities project, Singing the Nation into Being, Anthems and the Politics of Black Performance, which focuses on Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as the Black National Anthem. She received her PhD from the University of Virginia, where her research focused on Afro-German autobiographical narratives. Dr. Donaldson's academic research centers on the intersections of race, gender, class, sexual identity, and technologies. So it is my honor to um, turn things over to Dr. Donaldson and to our guest today, um, John Kantara. Thank you, Emily. And let me just uh, start by saying uh, happy Black History Month and welcome everyone. <laughs> um, I, it's truly an honor for me uh, to be in conversation with John Kantara today. Um, not just because I'm a former journalist and was also a technology journalist, but because of his incredible um, body of work um, and his generosity of sort of spirit and intellect. Um, uh, it really is truly an honor for me. Um, it would probably take me the entirety of our session here to read uh, <laughs> his introductory bio, so I'm going to foreshorten it um, a little bit. Um, John Kantara was born in 1964 in Bonn, Germany. He is the son of John Kwabena Amwateng, a student from Ghana, and Annegret Hinson, a German nurse from Neuss, Rhineland. Yeah. After his, yay. <laughs> <laughs> After his baccalaureate, Kantara was drafted as a medic to the German Navy in 1984. He graduated in political science from Free University Berlin in 91 with a thesis on self-organizing ethnic minority representation in Germany. From 1991 until 1993, he completed his postgraduate studies in international journalism at City University in London, England. His studies were then followed by seven years as a reporter for Die Zeit TV, the current affairs television program of the national weekly broadsheet newspaper Die Zeit. Since 2000, he has worked as a freelance documentary filmmaker specializing in science and technology documentaries. For over 20 years, Kantara has produced more than 70 TV documentaries and reportages for ZDF, Art3Sat, and ARD, and I hope I'm not 
mangling anything here on topics ranging from race, politics, war and conflict to economics and culture, filming extensively in North America, the Middle East, Asia, Europe and Africa. Currently, Kantar is developing and producing three one hour documentaries, one science documentary for Art TV on black holes and the role they played for the development of life as we know it. And I'm also a huge um, like physics fan and I've been studying and reading about black holes for the last couple of years now. So again, I'm gonna try to control my nerddom here, uh, but uh, I'm super excited to be there. And two parts of a five part German Canadian historical series on truth and lies in war and conspiracy theories for ZDF TV. Uh, he is married to Janine Kantara and has two children, one of whom also works with you on, on your documentary film, your son. And he's also a frequent con contributor for national and international newspapers. So if everyone could join me in just welcoming uh, John uh, today. Um, I want to start um, not at the very beginning, as I did with um, your, your bio here, but certainly sort of the very early years. Um, to, to ask you about your experiences of growing up in Germany and sort of coming into a, a recognition of your identity as a Black German. And then if you could talk a little bit also about sort of the move uh, into sort of uh, organization work um, that, that you uh, did. Okay. Well, um, Sonia, really, thank you for that really nice introduction, um, you know, uh, but you're right, I was born in 1964, which makes me almost uh, 60, uh, uh, I'm 58 this year, uh, and that's a long time, you know, um, living and, and, you know, being born in Germany as a Black man. Um, you know, I always say to, to you know, my, my North American friends, um, you know, when I was born on July 3rd, 1964, um, 6,000 miles away in Washington, D.C., uh, 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 the president, um, Lyndon B. Johnson, signed the Civil Rights Act um, on that very day. And, and um, so um, it, to me, the civil rights movement in and, 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 and America uh, was really, really important because it informed what was happening on the other side of the pond. And, uh, you know, I always tell them also that I was born in Germany 19 years after the Second World War, after complete, the complete devastation of Germany and uh, thankfully uh, the, the liberation of Germany, particularly by, by uh, U.S. troops. Uh, and I salute them for that because I, without them, I wouldn't be here. Um, so, uh, and black American uh, uh, troops as well, you know. Um, my mother told, used to tell me, you know, how she saw the first black man in her life, which was obviously an American soldier occupying Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I was born in 1964, the sight of a black man and a white woman carrying a pram, um, you know, uh, pushing a pram through Bonn was not normal. It was not normal at all. It was really difficult for my parents to have that relationship, um, to actually, um, uh, you know, uh, they had a relationship and uh, I was on the way. And, and the first thing my, my grandfather asked my mother, is he Christian? Yeah. Or, you know, his panic would have been if he would have been Muslim or something like that. Mm. Um, because my, my mother's side is very Catholic, very, very, uh, um, how to say, um, religious. Mm -hmm. And for them, you know, uh, color wasn't really the, the, the main thing. It was religion. And so, uh, you, you know, when my, my mother revealed, yes, my my my, my uh, friend, you know, John Senior is mm -hmm. Christian, you know, uh, my, my grandfather decided that they have to marry now because I was on the way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, when, um, uh, when I was there and my, my sister Rita was on the way, um, 
things were really difficult for my father and my mother. They lived at my grandparents' home and um, uh, people were not accepting this. Um, you know, uh, there were incidents where my mother was, um, you know, um, being harassed uh, by people. People were standing in the street, sh shaking their heads. How can that be? You know, and my father was a very, very proud man. He came from, he was an Ashanti, uh, came from Ghana as a student, um, and he, he never experienced racism in, in, in the way that he did in Bonn in the 1960s. And he didn't take it. I mean, he was not really, uh, what are these people doing? I mean, why are they doing this? Um, so the uh, union between my mother and my father didn't last too long. You know, um, they couldn't, it was re real pressure uh, was on them. Uh, and, uh, you know, while we were small, we were cued. Uh, we were, um, you know, people, you know, looking at us and, and, and uh, um, you know, my mother was, was, was asked whether she has, had adopted us, you know, uh, it was really a question of um, Germans are white, black people can't be German. And mm -hmm. so um, for us, it was really a, a difficult time to, to grow up because we did not have black role models. My father went away, um, he remarried, in Sweden, I have now a beautiful Swedish uh, 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 siblings, you know, and I'm very much in contact with them. They're really cool, uh, but we have to communicate in, in English because I can't speak Swedish. Uh, so um, you see, he was out of the frame mm -hmm. and um, my, my relatives are all white. And so I had no, no black role model, my sister Rita neither. And so, what we were doing was, um, you know, sucking up, in, if you want, um, American culture. Um, I mean, music, uh, films, black plantation films, uh, uh, soul music, jazz, uh, stuff like that, you know, was, you know, oh, wow, there were suddenly stars coming over and, and they were performing the Jackson Five. Uh, uh, and we were glued to the television, you know, to see us, ourselves, you know, as somebody, mm -hmm. you know, because all of these stars, they were somebody and they were, you know, um, performing and people were clapping to them and, you know, they won accolades and stuff like that. So we were really happy to see them. And um, only when we became older, um, like in, in our teens, in our mid-teens, we realized we are not alone because on the other side of the road, there was somebody else, you know, who looked like us. And we were shyly, you know, kind of, hey, you know, <laughs> and maybe I got a, a, a like, yeah, something, but, you know, back a glance or something, but we, I didn't know that person. So I couldn't cross the road and just say, hey, who are you, you know? So when we grow older in our, in our teens, in our late teens, in our, in our early twins, you know, um, things happened that where we, where we said, okay, we have to, to do something. And I met people in school, for instance, in, in the last year of high school, I met, you know, two Afro-German, black German guys, and we formed a band and, and, and we had, you know, I met other people. So we were kind of coming of age in a time in the 1980s where more and more black, we had a critical mass of black Germans and that critical mass actually um, um, exploded in a way that we basically said, okay, we are too many. What is our story? Mm -hmm. And um, we came together in all kinds of, um, all kinds of little um, um, groups. Uh, first of all, in I was in the first one in in Cologne and Düsseldorf, and then you know I knew there was a group in, in loosely in Berlin, in Munich, in Frankfurt. And so we had all kinds of groups in West Germany, and um, uh, you know when I went, uh, you know after my service in the Navy, I went for my studies. To, uh, to Berlin, which was 
still a city surrounded by a wall. You know, you had the American sector, the British sector, the French sector, and East Berlin, the capital of the GDR, was the Russian sector. And so, um, you know, but Berlin was like a pressure cooker. <laughs> It was, it was, that was a lit on and everything, and with the heat was on and we were doing things. And, you know, being a student, you know, in my, my, um, uh, uh, what is it called in English? Um, in my graduate studies, you know, we, we were basically kind of um, meeting each other and uh, we founded a group called the Initiative of Black Germans, ISD in Deutsch, yeah, the Initiative of Schwarze Deutsche. And um, that was really interesting because uh, he, I met all kinds of people there. Um, Maya Yim, good friend of mine, I met her there, you know. Um, he, friends I still have today, um, you know, were, were present and we decided, okay, let's do that formally, like we are Germans, okay? So it has to be in order. <laughs> we have to make an application at the court to be a real um, association uh, with um, with um, uh, uh, Satsung, uh, I forget the name now, what it is in in in, um, in English, but we had a written constitution basically of what we were planning to do. And um, we got the approval, the stamp of approval that we are now an Eingetragener Verein. Yeah, we are an association um, record, re um, recorded by by the courts. And uh, so we basically were working there and had a lot of fun, parties and all kinds of stuff, you know? Um, we were young, come on. And so uh, we, had, we had parties and um, then something happened. You know, probably all know Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord was um, an African-American poet, a lesbian writer, activist, feminist, I mean, all kinds of things. And she came to Berlin to, to teach at the Free University and my alma mater. And basically um, she had all kinds of, all kinds of uh, you know, the women went there because women's studies, what was that? I mean, gender studies, mm -hmm. we didn't know that. And so, um, uh, but Audrey was really instrumental because what she did is she, um, not only earlier uh, influenced um, a couple of um, women to write a book called Farbe Bekennen, uh, Showing Our Colors, which was instrumental for all of us um, um, because it was basically giving us an idea uh, that um, we are not only more than we see, but we had a history in this country, in Germany. Uh, Maya Yim, um, was not only a beautiful poet, uh, but she was a historian as well. She dug up evidence of us being in Germany, you know, uh, before the Second World War, before the First World War, you know, even, even earlier during German, German colonial times and even earlier. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there was a historic lineage suddenly here. There was a continuity here of us being present in Germany as Germans. And so um, the interesting bit is that Audrey Lord really was instrumental in helping to, um, to bring about this, this beautiful book, Farmer Buchanan. And I think it's, it's quite often the case that women are the first who are um, kind of um, initiating things. And so Audrey told all these ladies who were, you know, participating in writing this book said, you can't do that on your own, your struggle. You have to take your menfolk with you. And so basically, I really remember that. I, was, I think it was in 1986 or something like that. I went to um, a meeting with, uh, in Katharina Oguntoyes, a historian uh, a flat uh, in Berlin Kreuzberg and basically met my Ayim there and all the others and, and uh, Audrey Lord, and um, basically they said, you have to work together. You know, you, you have to do something together. And so that is actually the, 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 the founding of, of the Initiative of Black Germans, mm -hmm. initiated by women, um, seeded in the minds of, of young Black German women by an African-American, 
<laughs> you know? And um, so we, we f had our first Bundestreffen, our first, uh, you know, yearly meetings, and suddenly 400, 500 Black German people were there. And they all had similar stories. Mm -hmm. So um, that was really, you know, um, important for me and quite a few other people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, but now professionally, um, yeah, well, I'm well, a journalist. Well, I what, wonder, I wonder if you Sorry. could say, no, 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 I know I'm enjoying this. So, you know, I could stop me. Just sit if back. you don't stop me, I, I continue. So. Right. But I wanted to ask you go, to go back a little bit and, and you talk about your early experiences and the difficulty for, for your family and for yourself. And I'm wondering about those moments, right? That first moment you see another person who looks like you um, in Germany, right across the street. And the moment where suddenly you realize there is this critical mass. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the sort of effects on you in terms of your own developing consciousness, right, as a black, as a black German, and what that those experiences were like um, in your sort in your development. Well, as a as a young person, obviously you you try to find out who you are. Mm -hmm. Identity is is really important. Who am I? What am I? Um, you know. Am I the caricature uh, I'm presented by, you know, racist? Am I a man? Um, what kind of a man, you know? I mean, you're trying to find out whether you're gay, you're straight, you're bi, whatever. You know, I mean, you, you try to, to, to find your own identity, your own true self. Mm -hmm. And that is um, difficult if you don't have somebody who looks like you. And so, um, my my question was, as I said, I, I was looking to, towards the U.S. because there were other male role ma models. You know, I had no father in a way who could teach me that. So um, I was reading books. You know, I was a bookworm. You know, so I I read Eldridge Cleaver, Soul on Ice. I read, you know, I mean everything. Black America could have um, uh, basically sent towards me and, 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 but I'm not an American. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the question of who am I and, and you know, as a German was basically um, transformed to me a bit when I was in the national service, mm -hmm. because um, how do I explain that? Mm, the German Navy, in the mid-1980s was not accustomed to people who looked like me. I was always the only one, the only black face everywhere, you know? Um, so uh, they were qu quite, you know, flabbergasted to see me. You know, they didn't know how, how to deal with me in a way, you know? At first, you know, I was even a way, in a, in a way, mm, you know, am I really want to go into that bus with all this sh almost bald shaven uh, guys, blonde, blue eyed and so on. And I was a mean looking guy in a Navy uniform, corralling them into this green bus. And I thought, nah. you know, it was, I was in, on an island in the top north of Germany uh, base there. And um, I missed the bus to the base because I couldn't decide whether I really would like to go there or would be AWOL at the first day of service. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I didn't basically go, get in there. And so when the new recruits are coming, 1st of July, it, it, they, they have all hands full, so on base. So basically they have to give them uniforms, quartier, you know, chamber, stuff like this, all the kind of stuff. And since I came late, I came to the to the to the gate, and they had the most, I would say, um, how to say that in a polite way, um, they put in somebody they could, um, they didn't use, couldn't use on that busy day, so somebody who was a bit retarded, I would say, is it still okay to say retarded, or is that not okay? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think so, but yeah. You know, Sorry, but I don't, I don't know what, what the PC word would word. be now. Yeah. Um, but this person was not intelligent. 
-hmm. okay? Um, and so when I came late to the gate, he said, flat out said, nah, it can't be, not you. <laughs> he said, okay, I have a letter, I'm supposed to be here, I'm late, but mm. you know, nah, not you. And he refused to let me in, into the base, mm. uh, because uh, he couldn't picture that I might have been, you know. So um, in the end, I said, don't you want to call somebody, you know, who can basically read this piece of paper? Yeah? And that he did. And uh, then an officer came and said, whoa, you're late. And I got some, <laughs> some uh, shouting. But the interesting bit really is when I had my uniform and I was standing in line with all my other friends there, um, we all looked alike. We all had the same uniform. We all had the, 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 the bad food. We had the same eight men in one room, you know, bunk beds and stuff like that. Uh, we were all the same and nobody treated me differently. Ooh. And it was really interesting because I, I, I got um, elected as the representative of the new recruits by my fellow soldiers. Hmm. And um, I was, <laughs> you know, had to speak with, with the commanding officer every day and reporting on, you know, or every week, it was not every day, every week, you know, reporting on the, you know, how the new recruits get into into mm -hmm. things and stuff like that. And so um, I was really uh, shocked when they basically elected me because I thought, okay, uh, they trust me. And um, I think that over the years as a, as a conscript and, and in the, in the, being in the armed forces, that made me German. Mm. More than I, I, I um, uh, sometimes like to think, but it is, it is really, I think it, it also made me German, yes. Hmm. That's, in, that's really interesting. Um, so that's a really interesting thing to think about how your presence actually normalizes sort of presence, right? And black presence sort of right. uh, and more it's broadly. Completely normal in, today, right, know? in I mean, spaces. Do you think that also, um, uh, was a sim was that a similar experience to when you moved into journalism that you found that that or no? <laughs> yes, I mean I, I was lucky. I was I was in London and I had already a job um, offer from uh, the Financial Times. Mm -hmm. um, I had a placement with CNN World Business Today and Financial Times te Television, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I got to know an editor there. And he said, this, this guy is, is, you know, bright, he's doing his stuff. He wants to be a journalist. He's, he's, he's you know, give him a chance, give him a break. And I, then I interviewed, you know, a man, the managing editor of the Financial Times, and he actually gave me um, mm -hmm. a, a job offer and said, okay, we can use somebody who speaks languages. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, because not, nobody there spoke German. Um, and so, uh, and that's important for, for your students, you know, speak languages. <laughs> Never mind which language, but learn more than your own mother tongue. Mm -hmm. It's really important. Um, and so um, I got my job offer and realized that the site was planning to do um, television as well. Mm -hmm. And um, they informed themselves on what is masthead television in, uh, in London. And the lady came by and basically did her research there. And um, I wasn't there at the time when she was there, but I was told by one of my colleagues, hey, John, you know the side? Yeah, of course I know the side. Everybody knows the side. Uh, and um, yeah, they're planning to do television. And I said, what? I wanted to, go to do that. And so I called them and said, I heard that you want to plan, <laughs> you're, you're planning um, your new television show uh, coming up. You mm -hmm. know, can I, can I be, you know, I have time. Can I, can I come and, and be, you know, do a placement there? And, it, oh, this is completely secret. You know, oh, where do you know that from? <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, I heard it. And um, they invited me. I did um, a one month placement. And then at the end of the month, I got a job, you know, and I was, uh, um, I was junior, a junior reporter for the Zeit Television. Mm -hmm. And I did that job for seven years. Um, my wife, Janine, um, 
who was uh, in with me in London at the time, she hated it. <laughs> you know, we were just in, in London. We were mm -hmm. trying to settle in London. And then, you know, the guy goes back to, to Germany, you know, to, to follow his dream. And so, um, yeah, I did that. And when I came in there, um, the East Side, it's probably the most, it's like the New York Times for, for your listeners. It's like, it's like the weekly New York Times. Mm -hmm. It is intellectual, it is um, Hamburgian, Hanseatic. It's, 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 it's really, it's the best broadsheet newspaper in Germany, I would still say today. Mm -hmm. um, I love it. I love this place. I love the site. Okay. And so um, um, you, you go there, you know, Helmut Schmidt was, was the publisher, the former chancellor, you know, mm -hmm. you go there and you realize, wow, everybody has at least a PhD. It seemed mm -hmm. to me like that. Um, you know, they're so learned. They're, they, 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 you know, they know so much. How can I, how can I survive here? And, um, but in the end, um, he, I was the only one, again, there were, there were no other black people, not even people of Turkish descent or Asians, or, no, lily white. Wow. And uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> I just started and, um, uh, and I, 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 um, I at one point said, we can't say that these days like that. So we have to do it, you know, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the way they were talking about black people, we're talking about foreigners, they were talking about, you know, migration as such, you know, that wasn't really um, up to speed. And so we, we, my presence, I believe changed things because I was suddenly sitting in this in the editorial conference, I was not allowed to talk because none of the television people, television was a little bit bad, yeah? So, uh, you know, not, none of the television people were allowed to talk in a big editorial conference. But we were sitting there and I was among them and um, people were looking at, oh, ooh, somebody else, you know, there's more color in this room. And so uh, <laughs> it was really, really funny to see, but in the end, the conversation changed just by being there. Mm -hmm. The conversation changed and we could, could uh, do other things. We had more people of color, you know, being represented not only in the editorial room today, the site is, is really, I think at the forefront of being, um, um, you know, giving women, uh, 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 women of color uh, uh, a chance to, to, to to do their career so that it's it's a lot everything is there now it has mm -hmm. completely changed from where mm -hmm. i was still not enough i think but there's always room for more but right. uh, um so, you know it, i was the only one in the beginning yeah. so you spent seven there seven years there and then you decided to go into documentary filmmaking yeah. um so what was um what was the sort of the thing that convinced you to to shift? Uh, were there things of are there things about documentary filmmaking that maybe weren't afforded in journalism, or what? How did you decide? Well, there's two things here. Two things. One is, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one is is the easy answer, and one is a bit more mm -hmm. complicated. Right. Um, <clears throat> the easy answer is that um, the site um, was sold. Um, the proprietor died and the, the site was sold to another um, publishing house and they had their own um, television company producing um, films for public television, for, you know, German television. And so um, they decided to stop the weekly uh, magazine format um, and move to Berlin again, you know, um, and do long form, long form um, uh, documentaries. Mm -hmm. And so I did my first long form documentaries um, as um, an employee of uh, um, still the side, but in a different, in a different um, economic structure. Mm -hmm. And we were doing um, long, form document, long, long form documentary, 30 minutes, uh, you know, for um, public television. 
And um, I cut my teeth in, in doing this, this long form stuff. And I thought, yeah, that's far better than just five minutes here, five minutes there. You know, you can actually tell a story in 30 minutes. You have time to do something, to develop a narrative, to do something here. Mm -hmm. And so I got hooked by, by doing this. And another thing happened. I was, um, um, I was intrigued that nobody really wanted to do science documentaries because in a way some journalists are lazy you know i mean you, you it's it's wrapping your your head around complex uh theories like einstein's relativity theory or you know uh black holes and, and stuff like that um not every journalist wants to do that so you have specialists doing this and i specialist in i'm I specialized in this i love doing science documentaries mm -hmm. uh, so i did uh, all kinds of i did a, my first long form documentary was on nanotechnology you know uh, um, and what nanotechnology is nobody heard about that mm -hmm. nanotechnology what is that and so um i did a 30 minute documentary about that and i was wow this is cool and um, so that was an opening for, for people who were crazy enough to do this crazy stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, and who would not really think, oh, you know, politicians or stars. And I don't care, you know, I don't care about, oh, okay, I, I shouldn't probably shouldn't say that here in this <laughs> setting, but um, Beyonce. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I mean, my children were were really were really looked at me like if I was be from a, an alien because I said Jay Z, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> they said, Papa, how can you not know? But I'm, uh, you know, if, mm -hmm. if they would have said Miles Davis, okay, you know, that's my my line of work. But um, yeah, it's generational. So, yes, and I couldn't do that, and mm -hmm. so. Um, it was, and then the third thing was, really thing is, I was still the youngest there. And um, they had some restructuring and uh, they decided they don't need too many, you know, uh, journalists no more. And they basically said, okay, um, who is the youngest? Uh-huh, John is the youngest, he's the one to go. And um, so basically I had, I had to leave and I decided to, to become a freelance documentary filmmaker and I'm doing it ever since, mm -hmm. you know, and I never stopped uh, producing documentaries. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really funny how things work, but I, I enjoy what I do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, are, that's the way. What are some of the best parts of the work that you do? And then what are some of the challenges for you? I'm not only doing science. I do also, sometimes I do politics okay. and, and uh, mo the most challenging things I've done in, was in, in war zones. I've mm -hmm. done uh, war reporting. Um, I've been to Baghdad. I've been to Mali. I've been to, uh, in the war in, in the Bosnia Herzegovina um, and, and that was not nice. Yeah. Um, so that was really challenging. Um, um, in terms of reporting, um, you know, you travel the world. I mean, I've been everywhere, save Australia and uh, South America. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so, you know, and it's nice if, 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 you know, you can go and travel places and see people and somebody pays your wage and, and your flights and your hotel and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I just come back yesterday. I was in, in, in Geneva and in, in Lausanne the day before that, I was in Paris, you know, and so I I come around and I, I I love traveling, you know. I've been to to the U.S. I can't count anymore how often I've been to 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 the U.S. and particularly I love going to to Vancouver because I've been there several times, four times I think, in Vancouver, and um, I love I love uh, the West Coast uh, mm -hmm. of North America. It's beautiful and. Uh, uh, I like going there and see places. So that's the benefits, of, of course. Awesome. Um, so the other sort of um, circle that I kind of want to want to make around is I'm really just kind of in awe and fascinated by your career and the circuits that you that you've taken, but also seeing the the, the interconnectedness of the of the work that you're doing. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about 
uh, your work and your experiences, and then how you bring that into the academic space in terms of working with students. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so um, journalism in, lives by um, uh, or is is interesting to me because I I can quench my insatiable curiosity. I'm curious. <laughs> I have to say. You know, I, I'm curious, curious about people, and that's the main thing you have to, the main thing you have to have about, if you want to be a journalist, you have mm -hmm. to be curious about people. You have to understand and try to understand how people work, what makes them their mind tick, what is the the what is, what is their motivation, why do they do things, and if you see, for instance, a scientist explaining um, his life work to you and and you see his his or her eyes lighting up and 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 the you know the passion they have for their work you know this is beautiful and 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 you can basically if you have the talent and the, know the techniques how to transport that into a narrative and explain um what they are doing to your viewers um that's a beautiful thing and um i think you need, I love telling stories. And, and um, that's my main thing. Maybe I'm a, still an African griot, you know, somebody who, who needs to tell stories. I probably will never end telling stories because that's what I do. You know, I tell stories and, and, and try to, to explain to people, um, you know, uh, I tell not only my story, I tell other people's story. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know that's what I like about documentary filmmaking. You know, I never went into feature films or something like that, and I was always asked, you know, why don't you do feature films? Yeah, because you know um, I like to work with real people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I cherish uh, um, actors, and I go to the theater all the time, and and I I like to go to the cinema and see nice movies, mm -hmm. of course. But would I? You know, I would prefer going to into a um, Bangladesh and, and Dakar and in, in, in India in the in the slums and do a story there, you know, and tell those people's stories. Mm. And so um I'm a documentary filmmaker, you know, I'm not too much interested in, in feature films. My son is completely different. He wants to do feature films, he wants to be the next Kosisi, you know. Uh mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> I I just you know want to tell stories from regular folks about mm. regular folks. So in addition to this curiosity, right, and, and also oh, this genius. love of, uh, of for, uh, for storytelling, um, what are some of the ways uh, that you sort of train the next generation or talk to them about the work uh, of journalism, particularly in this in this time in these times right so we're in the middle of a pandemic but you know young people are also dealing with like sort of massive disinformation campaigns globally there's so many challenges to journalism um, yeah. what are some of the ways that you um might advise young journalists uh, well you it's really interesting that you hit on this one because um i just um i'm, I'm also doing communication studies um mm -hmm. And I'm working together with a, a bunch of people trying to combat hate speech, fake news, and disinformation, particularly in the West African con context. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as you know, my father uh, was uh, from Ghana, Ashanti. Mm -hmm. I, I'm happy uh, to, to go to Ghana uh, quite often uh just to see my family there and and uh, i love the country it's, it's a really beautiful country uh, anyone who listens if you have the time uh, go to ghana and it's uh, really cool um uh, particularly um around uh, christmas and, and new year's eve uh the country is flooded by african americans you know <laughs> so mm. it's, it's amazing um you should see that but Ghana lives, sits in, a, in, in the vicinity of countries which are very unstable. Just uh, last week, we had a coup in Burkina Faso to the north of, of, of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And um, Ghana is kind of um, surrounded by countries where the Islamist threat is really palpable. 
you know, from Mali coming down into Burkina Faso, but also uh, uh, Chad and Niger have problems, Cote d'Ivoire has problems. So um, I'm trying to, to help, um, you know, something with, with something we call narrative management in conflict dynamics. And that is um, basically uh, the idea that you, you can, um, if you empower people to put out their own narratives, mm -hmm. then they can counter uh, those Islamist narratives um, and fake news and, and hate speech in a way which um, can diffuse a situation, you know, because mm -hmm. if people only hear one, one side, you know, um, that's a problem. You have to have a multitude of, of um, um, opinions and a multitude of voices available to you mm -hmm. in order to make your own, up your own mind. So um, the plurality of information is important mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, Russians don't have that. You know, they only have the, the their their state of media, which is blurring always the Kremlin's truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in in the sense that if you have more information available, um, you should be you know as an intelligent being able to to read those those messages and make up your own mind. Mm -hmm. So, what happens if you do if you empower women to to tell their own stories? Mm -hmm. in the West African context. What happens if you empower youth to do the same or LGBTQI groups or farmers or even faith leaders, you know, still? What happens if you, if you empower people to find their voice and, and tell their own stories? That's why I, I believe in that. And I think we, we can help people who have no voice today mm -hmm. to find their own voice and, and create their own narratives. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea behind this narrative management concept, which I'm pushing. <coughs> I just, did, with with Joshua, I did a film about that. Right, um, watch that you, film. That's did you didn't see that? Yes, yeah. I, did. I did. Narrative yeah. management. Right, and it's really well done. And especially as it addresses the implications for 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 West Africa, but also for Europe, right? And, and, and Germany. If you find the link, put it in there um, in, in, the, in the chat. Okay. Um, if you can, um, you can put it in the chat. And so I'm happy to, you know, um, to talk to people about that because mm -hmm. we are trying to push that further uh, mm -hmm. because it's not only viable, obviously, in the West African context, right. it's also viable wherever you have groups who have no voice. Mm -hmm. What we're planning to do is we try to train, you know, um, civil society groups, but also um, people from the military, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the government. So we try to, to, to get all kinds of groups to, to tell them how they should use, for instance, social media, um, how to check uh, sources, you know, um, basic journalism skills, you mm -hmm. know, um, to check so sources, to double check, yeah, narrative mentioned in conflict dynamics, that's the one, thank you. Um, because, you, you know, that if you do that, you can help um, diffusing situations and not send in the military. Right. Because if you send in the military, it's always too late, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to do that earlier. And, mm -hmm. and it's basically trying conflict prevention. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. um, knowing that, of course, skills of a journalist can be used in a demagoguery way of, uh, as well. Right. But, you know, if I wouldn't believe that human beings are essentially cap capable, capable to be good and bad, you know, I wouldn't do that. But I, I, I think, um, you know, there is so much good out there, mm. you know, uh, we should not, we should not be, you know, let it uh, being drowned uh, drowned out you say i think so um, yeah. Yeah. um hmm. so uh you know stuff like that we should we should encourage people yeah. to find their own voice and, and find their own way to communicate yeah. and i want to help that yeah it seems to me as i'm sitting here talking about narrative management with you it seems to me that it's related to what you described in those very early years of uh 
Black German Afro -Gen German identity formation, and also yeah. right uh, the publication of Farber Buchanan. That it seems to me that that was a sort of an early form of narrative management, right, for Black yeah. Germans, right. So can you talk a little bit about sort of how that functioned for you in those days? Yeah, in the early days, you know, we published a publication mm -hmm. called. Uh, the first issue was actually called uh, Uncle Tom's Faust. <laughs> uh, that was uh, yeah. that was my my. Uh, I have to admit that that was my um, idea, oh. and everybody said, "Oh well, yeah, but we had no better names." Okay, first edition. Do I have it here? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, now we get to see it. Mm hmm. Nice. It, yeah, it's it's the uh, Uncle Tom's Faust, and this yes. is one of the first meetings we had in, and you see on the back, ISD groups in the, the BRD, the acronym for, for the Federal Republic of Germany. Mm -hmm. And you see West Germany, of course, mm -hmm. and this is Berlin. Yeah, and this here, the space in between was the GDR. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we, that is the first issue here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's really interesting because we we we, we wrote all kinds of uh, you know critiques and, and poems and all kinds of stuff. You know, we had, for instance, an article about Martin de Bobe here in there. You see, that's the 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 tube, the the U-Bahn in Germany in Berlin, and Martin mm -hmm. de Bobe was a colonial subject, a German colonial subject who came to Germany. I think in 18, uh, 1896, yeah, mm -hmm. from Liberia to, to, to Berlin, yeah? And uh, mm -hmm. he was, um, he, well, I think it was not Liberia, I think in the end it was Cameroon. But anyways, uh, we tried to do, to do um, um, a publication. It was later called Afrolook. And the second edition was already called Afrolook mm -hmm. uh, because nobody liked the name of the Thomas <laughs> Paus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, you know, um, yeah. yeah, we published it from my student flat, and so. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. And what year true. was that? What year was that, Uncle Tom's Faust? That's that's. <laughs> I don't. Uh, mm. Oh, it's even my 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 address there. Um, oh. I think it's 1986 or oh, 1987. Wow. I'm not sure. Something like that. Wow. Yeah, obviously, you know, we wouldn't do that mistake anymore, but mm -hmm. it is, I think, I think it's 1986. We have to ask Janine she, because she was in the end, my mm -hmm. wife, she was the, in the end, the editor of, of uh, uh, the paper. Oh, wow. And um, wow. she, she organized, uh, she mm -hmm. has all copies, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, but true, enabling your, your own finding your own voice, enabling your, your own community to find your voice, yeah. be it by publication, radio, films, uh, social media. Today, you can have a plethora of things you can do. And right. it's um, really um, interesting that you can um, connect to so many people through social, mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it's a great way uh, to self-organize and, and you know, find your own self your identity right. it's work on your identity mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful um well i am going to um turn it over to our our guests who have been putting questions in the q a yes. and the chat i see and so Ooh, i'm yes i'm hoping that either emily or maybe rosemary can help me out a little bit here so um Sure. Um, we received one one question in the chat that I think is um, particularly relevant right now. So um, I watched, the person says, I watched with fascination your documentary, Die Macht der Vorurteile, or The Power of Prejudice. Apart from political speech, like this speech given by President Steinmeier and a few um, existing anti-racism laws under which in this person's opinion, racist incidents are hard to prove. How can Germany effectively combat open racism and prejudice? 
It's a big well, one. <laughs> yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a theme for one hour um, or, or more. Uh, but in the end, in a nutshell, Germany is a is a democracy. It's a country of laws, and um, laws should apply to everyone in equal measure. Yeah. So um, I think um, first of all, we we have to have we have to recognize that some, something like racism actually exists, you know? Um, and that, uh, you know, it's a blemish on, on, on the, the potential of so many people um, because it stops you, you know, from in your tracks, it can stop you in your, tra in your tracks. Maybe you achieve something great. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm sure Americans know that, um, um, the uh, um, Pfizer uh, BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine was developed in Germany. It was developed in by BioNTech, and the two founders of BioNTech are two immigrants, two two Turkish German Im immigrants. You know, um, there was a time in the in the U.S. where 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 the U.S. was welcoming to to so many immigrants and benefited a great deal mm -hmm. from from people who migrated. You know, to America, to to uh, uh, I mean, uh, almost everyone can 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 find a, a, an immigrant in in their lineage. Mm -hmm. um, but in Germany, we had this idea of being a homogeneous country for for so long, and and it's uh, it's now just now, for instance, with these two scientists who who really saved the world, you know, with their with their vaccine. Um, I hope that they will get the Nobel Prize um, for for that. Yeah, but you know, they're from humble beginnings. You know, and 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 their their, their parents were were just normal people, migrants, and and now, you know, this is possible in our country. You know, we we should tell those stories more often, and and say, you know, everyone is the same under the law. Um, and when that what what that means is, if you discriminate against somebody and there's a law punishing this, you should be punished for that. But that means that politicians have to be honest about this. For instance, our last minister of the interior uh, did not believe that the police can be racist because it's outlawed to be racist. So he refused to to come up with a study to find out if and to what measure, you know. Uh, uh, police officers could be racist. I know that there is racial profiling in my country. I know that. I'm a black man. I live here. You know. So um, you know. Uh, to me, that's not a not a question. If I drive, you know, with my car or in a train, and the police is stopping me, you know, but nobody else is being searched or stopped or you know, stop and frisk. Uh, and so. It, now we have a new government and, and the, the new inter interior minister said, yes, we're going to have a study. And that scientific study will come up with a result. And then we ho I hope we're going to discuss this. And if laws need to be changed for that, the better. But in the end, we are all, you know, subject um, 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 to, to the law, same laws. And then, you know, other than that, if we would I don't want vigilantes to go around and, 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 and push through their own law from neither side. So uh, whether they are autochtone German or uh, whether they are, they are migrants or, you know, the descendants of migrants, uh, new Germans, as we call them, you know, um, he, we should be able to trust in the police uh, to, to protect us all. And, and so yeah, that will, things will change. It's a snail. It's a snail pace. Mm. It's not quick. I've seen that in my, you know, fifty-eight years. It's not quick, and um, uh, but it is changing. It's not the same. We are no longer the same Germany as you know when I was born. So, lots has changed. I'm not alone anymore, for one. <laughs> yeah, I I think that was a that that was a, a question that was posed. Um, in the chat, the difference in terms of racial attitudes when you were younger, growing up, and and now, mm -hmm. um, 
experiences, but also attitudes, um, some of the changes that you've, you've witnessed or experienced? Yeah, I mean, the changes is obvious because, you know, we have now um, Black people on national te television and not as refugees, you know, but as people who are actually reading the news or uh, um, are uh, journalists in the field. Um, you have, we have, uh, you know, um, all kinds of, of diversity coming up. And there is a general acceptance by most people that diversity is actually helping us rather than hindering us. Mm -hmm. uh, there is always this 25%, maybe 30% of people who will always think that, you know, there is such a thing as race when we know from biology, there is no race. There is only the human race. There is nothing like, you know, our differences on the outside are just skin deep. On the inside, we are very similar. You know, uh, to that extent that an East African that is in my is in my film. You know, I was told by by a, a geneticist, a paleogeneticist, an East African has more similarities genetically with a Asian or a, a, a North American mm -hmm. than an East African has uh, um, with with uh, um, a West African or a South African. So. The notion of, of race is completely, it's, 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 there is no such thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were digging in, in East, um, East Germany, in Thuringia, for human remains, uh, which were hunter-gatherer remains, and we, we were able to, to classify their genetic code, we found out that these people who were living 7,000 years ago in Germany, or what is now Germany, were Black. How's that? <laughs> you know, there were no white folks. And, and uh, uh, because, you know, they had blue eyes already, yeah, but they were in, in their skin tone Black. It's only when, when, you, when you change your diet in a Northern Hemisphere, you know, away from fish and meat to more uh, veggies and, and wheat and stuff like that, there's an evolutionary pressure to, to regulate your skin tone because of vitamin D production, you know? Um, so what I'm trying to say is there is no biological basis for racism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not there. It's a cultural concept. It's something people invented something around 500 years ago, you know, <laughs> with colonialism. And, and so um, to me, it, it is really important to, to, to lay out the facts and, and, and bring out and, and say, hey, this is biology. We can, I can prove it now, mm. you, know? <laughs> yeah. you know? Obviously there will be 25 and 30% who will always say, nah, I don't believe that. <laughs> You know, yeah. Yeah. you know, I can Thank see you. that you are different than for me. And <laughs> right. so I believe it's, at, it's at the level of the visual, right, for them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, here's an interesting question that was asked a little earlier. Um, but, uh, Ruth um, wants to know, were you drafted into the Navy? And if not, why did you sign up? No, we all were drafted. Yeah. Until I think eight or nine years ago. Mm -hmm. That was the draft in Germany. Yeah. So people, every eligible uh, men, right. mm -hmm. not female, but men um, above 18 had to serve either in the armed forces or do, you know, a test which would basically say, oh, yeah, I'm a conscientious objector. And if you are, you would have to do more time um, in social, for social work or whatever, you know. Um, but after the, the wall came down and, and Germany was reunified, we had a huge army in, in Germany, far too big, you know, everyone would have been afraid of us, Germans again, with a half a million of, of soldiers, uh, nobody wanted that, our neighbors didn't want that because mm, they were tinged twice in the, in the, in the 20th century, so um, they said, mm-mm. Mm, 
So we had to reduce our, um, you know, the, the, the scale of the armed forces. And uh, in order, there comes a point that you have, the, the, it's, it's just no longer any, the draft is no longer just because some get drafted, some not. You know, some have to do the uh, do military service, some have to do, um, you know, social service and some have to do nothing. So in the end, there was a big discussion whether that is still um, viable for, for a modern Germany. Mm -hmm. And it was decided uh, that the draft would not be abolished, but put out, out of um, a force. So um, it is still on the books. The government could bring it back in times of need but um right now you know we don't even have the structures to 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 you know to register all men and why now all men what about the women you know um so if you would have to re if you want to redo that and, and and bring it back you have to do that for both sexes you can't just leave the women out of the hook mm -hmm. you know and just take the men um, particularly if you decide, oh yeah, we bring something back like that. So, you know, create a peace corps and, uh, you know, have, have uh, the army and social work. And, you know, there, there, are, there are discussions now in Germany whether we should have a national service institution where people do, when they're young, give something back to society and, and do something and they can choose whether they go to the army or the armed forces or go into social services and, and, and train as in the Peace Corps, you know, stuff like that. Mm. So um, yeah. um, I think we will get that somehow at, at one point in Germany so that uh, we have a more, you know, um, otherwise the, the German armed forces are having real problems to get young people, men and women, you know, and uh, the question is, uh, whether they they how to do that you know, how to interest people to 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 go into the armed forces, and I'm you know I'm a reservist I'm still in the in the in the uh, Navy Reserve, oh. so um, you know old man <laughs> I'm not fast <laughs> anymore. So uh, <laughs> but the, the thing is um, I do I do lots of political um, um, education yeah. in the armed forces you know and and and. Uh, recently, I was in 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 uh, East Germany, deep in East Germany, where I wouldn't go uh, um, with my my family, <laughs> you know, for vacation in Erzgebirge, because I think it's it's uh, um, well, you know, you want to feel welcome in a countryside when 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 you when you when you go on vacation, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I don't think that too many black people would be too too. Uh, be, would be welcome too much. Um, now, I know that some people would disagree with me here, uh, but why risk it? So, um, uh, you know, but I made a point of going there in uniform to, to, to teach, you know, um, um, some, some um, soldiers there in, in terms of diversity and racism awareness and stuff like that. So I did that. Um, and that was was good. It was good because I think I could catch some, you know. <laughs> did I answer the question or did I stray away? You answered it and then some, which is we have more, <laughs> <laughs> we have more knowledge, which is not a dangerous thing. It's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so uh, there's a question, a, a couple of questions. I'm actually going to ask Emily for help because the type is super small in the Q&A and I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Um, no think, worries. <laughs> thank you. I'm just sort of um, like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> So one of our students um, has asked um, or said, I grew up in Hanau, uh, Frankfurt, Germany. And until I was 23 and experienced more than enough racism while attending school, as well as my Ausbildung, which is um, 
um, an internship or yeah, apprenticeship. Once I moved to the U.S., I was embraced by most African Americans and felt accepted for the first time in my life. I've noticed that the racism in Germany has gotten a lot more intense lately. My question is, how do you feel about the uprise um, of the AfD or the Alternative for Deutschland? That's the alternative for Germany, a new political party, and the impact of this. Well. Um... I don't want to engage in whataboutism, you know, um, um, because I think the the Americans have uh, their own uh, share of extreme parties, or at least one party, uh, which is 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 mm, anyways. But no whataboutism in my case here in Germany, where I think that um, the AfD is losing. Is losing uh, in the last elections. They were they were losing deputies in parliament, um, representatives. Uh, they are uh, in fight. There are big infights in the in the in the um, in the AfD, um, and uh, so I'm not sure how viable that will be in the future. There will be there for maybe one or two or three election cycles. That will be there, but um, people are realizing that they will never get to power. Um, that will never get to power. So in terms of the AfD, um, I think they're already a thing of the past. What I'm more con concerned is, uh, about is the potential for radicalization they have. So um, there, there is the possibility that there will be um, um, a, a splinter group from them even further to the right. Uh, like, you know, white nationalists, um, you know, some, you know, you have the Aryan Brotherhood kind of, you know, splinter groups or who, uh, who, was that not in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, uh, where they had this, this infamous uh, Fackelhoff, um, this with the torches. Um, that was where well. that, Charlotte, Charlotte well. Charles no, sorry, sorry about of, that. It was the, the University geography. of Virginia. <laughs> yeah, what, what, ch, ch, yeah, but Charlotte's will, huh? Mm -hmm. um, where they chanted, Jews will not replace us. I mean, hello? Uh, 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 this is, um, we hadn't had that so far, but we had other incidents, you know? Um, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised that that uh, um, if, that somebody will, some extreme fringe group will come out. Um, there's a saying in German, um, und der Schoß aus dem dies kroch ist fruchtbar noch. You know, and uh, so it's basically, um, you know, the, the ideas of extreme right um, um, Nazism is still there in Germany. Um, I just think that they're not capable of, of uh, taking power uh, through the ballot box because it's, it's, it's maybe 10, 20% of the population who thinks so. 80% do not think, think like that, whether they're conservative or liberal or whatever, you know? I mean, hey, it's a free country. So you can be conservative, you can be liberal and, and still be a Democrat in a sense of, you know, um, um, adhering to your constitution. But um, uh, uh, these extremists who want to destroy uh, uh, the democratic state, you know, there's a, it's, it's a tiny mi minority. And I don't think that they will have, um, you know, enough power through the ballot box to, to uh, challenge that. Mm. And that's, Positive, I think. That's, I, I hope so. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Is it? Are there questions? Uh... Um, the student in the, yeah, so the student um, who asked this question also said, thank you for answering my question. It was in Charlottesville that this took place and um, that she totally agrees with the uprise, the increase of extremism in the US as well. It's very scary here. Yeah, but you know, everybody has to work in their, where they are. So, I mean, yeah. uh, 
you know, I'm not an American and I want, don't want to be, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a European, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a strong support of the European project, European integration. Um, uh, so to me, but I know about the US and we are friends. You know, I like to be in, in, in America and I've seen so much of it and so many good natured people are there. Um, and 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 uh, you have the, you know, you have the idiots as well. Sorry, yeah. Um, uh, but you have so much good-natured people, um, and you should be able to come over your differences. The same as we have to do that in Europe. I mean, we we have to work to to come together. And, and to me, as a European, of course, I love going to Italy. You know. Oh, let's go to Italy. It takes me, you know, 12 hours by car, but then I can uh, maybe even less, 10 hours by car. And then I, I ski in the Dolomites. Or when I take a plane one hour from, from Berlin, in, in, you know, I can go to the Baleares and, and can go to Spain, to Barcelona, to Madrid, to London, you know, to Paris. And, and they all speak different languages. And and uh, it's it's beautiful. So I mean, we we live. We are blessed to live in a European Union in a in a continent like that. And do we want to destroy that because we say, ah, uh, you know, nationalism? Ah, nah, no, I don't think so. You know, and we 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 have to work with the U.S. because there are other threats. You know, um, you know, we want to. I rather be with the Americans. And with the Russians or with the Chinese, I have to say that, mm. you know, in terms of political alliances, mm. yeah, nothing racial here. It's just uh, uh, political alliances. Okay. <laughs> I got you. Uh, yes, I, I, I got you. Um, I think uh, Reginald Bess has a question. Can you speak to your work and yes. or association with Theodore Mikhail? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Theodore was a dear, dear friend of mine. I actually got to know him on a trip in 1997 um, when uh, we had the first Black German African American cultural exchange program. Mm -hmm. And we were invited to go to Howard University and to is that Northwestern University in Chicago, can I be? Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. And um, we were invited to go there. And so we, we had a group of maybe 20 um, Black Germans um, coming over to the US and talk to our American brethren and, and sisters, you know? Um, and it was really nice because we were advertised in the South side of Chicago as the Germans are coming. <laughs> that was really funny, <laughs> the posters there. And I couldn't believe it that we were not Americans, that we were Germans, and we were speaking German, this funny language, what is this? And it was so, so nice to be there with young people. And uh, we had one person with us who, were, who was our Nestor, who was the oldest, and that was Theodore. I heard about, had heard about him, but I never met him before. And um, so I, uh, it was UIC in Chicago, okay. Thank you. Um, and we basically um, went to a function with him in uh, at the Goethe Institute in, in, in Chicago, I think it was. And um, he was, was sitting there and uh, canapes and stuff like that. And we were talking um, and then I realized, okay, Theodore is sitting with another older gentleman there. And I'm a journalist and I'm curious. So I was trying to, what are they talking about? Oh, they're talking in German. And hey, this guy is talking with a Hamburgian accent. And I thought, who is this? You know, turns out it was Hans J. Masakoy, Hans Jürgen Masakoy, who was sitting there, uh, you know, living in Chicago. He got the invitations and they were sitting there and they were talking about how they both survived Nazi Germany. And I thought, my goodness, you know, what are they talking? This is incredible. I never knew. And then Hans invited us to come to his flat. He was moving out. He was retiring from Ebony Magazine as the managing editor there. 
And um, Hans actually uh, uh, invited us to, to his home. Um, I think he lived in the Sears, Sears Towers or something like that, Lake Michigan side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Had the same view. <laughs> wow. You know, and um, uh, he, he basically showed me some photos. And um, among the photo was, was this little photo of a little boy with a polunda, you know, one, one of these, these vests and a swastika on, on the, and it, that was him. And I thought, what is this? And then in the end, he told me that he was about to write his autobiography and whether I wanted to, to read it when it's finished. And I said, yes, I don't want to only read it. I want to make a film about it. <laughs> and so um, he told me that he was um, a good friends with Ralph Giordano, who was a very famous Jewish German um, reporter and, and documentary filmmaker in, in Germany. They knew each other from Hamburg, from the sandbox, basically. Yeah, they were friends. And um, so uh, in 1999, I got a chance to do um, uh, a documentary about uh, Ralf Giordano and Hans Masakoy. And it's called uh, Und wir waren Deutsche, and we were Germans. And um, I did that, you know, it was one of the few films I did on specifically on that subject. Because, you know, oh, I, I never wanted to be labeled as John the guy for, you know, black uh, themes or something like that, you know, or the guy to go to when it comes to racism. I, I want to be a journalist. I want to do all stories, not only one. Yeah, I don't want to be pigeonholed and labeled and, and stuff like that. So, um, but Und wir waren Deutsche was really nice because it, it reminded me, you know, these two older guys walking among their neighborhood in, in Hamburg. And uh, uh, I went to see Hans in Chicago. I went with him through Gage Park where he lived the civil rights movement. He, I saw pictures of him together with Dr. Martin Luther King and with Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. I, went, I actually went with Hans um, to Muhammad Ali's ranch and we had tuna sandwiches with him. That was one of my most spectacular, uh, you know, memories. Yes, I interviewed Muhammad Ali <laughs> and had tuna sandwiches with him. That was so cool. Um, <laughs> and in the end, we did this film to show that, you know, the African, um, uh, the, the Black German and the, and the Jewish German um, uh, experience is very similar. You know, we, we were, both groups were persecuted by the Nazis, the Jews more than the, than the Blacks, because, uh, you know, Hans was told by one of his teachers, and I have that quote in my film, um, Hans was told, when we are done, the teacher told him, when we're done with the Jews, we're coming after you. And that's, that was not an empty threat, uh, uh, because it happened. You know, we had Black people in, in concentration camps. Theodor von Michael actually survived in, as, in a slave labor camp in, in the outskirts of Berlin. So Theodor actually opened up the, the, you know, us to another dimension of, of our um, existence. You know, we I had no clue that, that so many, you know, black people were also persecuted by the Nazis and he brought that back to life. He was a witness and, um, um, to me, he was a good friend. Um, uh, he was a good friend to my children, and and he was a uh, he, he was a uh, uh, an absolute rock for us. And it helped. He, you know, I'm, I'm not sure whether you know that, but he was the first black German spy. <laughs> you know, he was he was in the in the uh, Bundesnachrichtendienst, uh, and he was uh, the guy who. Who was uh, had the African brief in 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 the, for the Bundesnachrichtendienst, our CIA, you know, and it's so funny to to see that in only later in his life, you know, when we were together, and I pressed him and said, "Well, what are you doing there? Tell me a little bit," you know, he told me a bit, but it's um, yeah, it's a great guy, and uh, I'm I'm very honored to to count him 
as my one of my friends, you know, dear friend. It was a dear friend. John, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you and perhaps we're going to have to bring you back more stories, but it's that time. Yeah. So I'm sorry, but well, I'm having I'm having a chance to talk to to some of your students on uh, next Tuesday. Absolutely. So, uh, so we'll continue this conversation in our classroom. Wonderful. And yeah. then we'll share the video with our audience here. OK, cool. So as we bring yet another amazing event to a close, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation once again to John, Sonia, and Emily, and importantly, to Davidson College for making this and so many other wonderful conversations possible. Today's recording will soon be among the others on our YouTube channel. Please consider joining us from February 17th to the 20th, 2022, when the fifth BGHRA conference will be hosted virtually in collaboration with Africana Studies at Rutgers University Camden. The conference will not only honor Black History Month, but importantly celebrates the 10th anniversary of the BGHRA. Yeah, cool. Our theme is All Black Lives Matter, Black Germany and Beyond, and registration is now open at tinyurl.com bghra2022. Visit our website at bghra.org for all the details about what promises to be a phenomenal series of events over four days. Proceeds from your purchases purchases at our conference swag shop will go towards supporting Black German artists and graduate student-led initiatives. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter and YouTube channel and to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. After the conference is before the conference and a new series of events, Black Germany and beyond will commence right after this one. Finally, we hope that you've enjoyed today's conversation as much as we have. Until next time, thank you again for your time and attention. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay.